Welcome to Nappy's presentation tonight of Mentor Live. Presentation tonight is going to be Stop Teaching About Safety. Our presenter will be Thomas Turner, Tom Turner, ATP, CFI, MEI, National Flight Instructor Hall of Fame, and a longtime friend of Nappy. Tom has over 4,600 hours with 2,600 hours of dual given, specializing in type specific transitions and recurrent training in high performance singles and light twins. He was the 2010 National FAA Safety Team Representative of the Year and 2008 FAA Central Region CFI of the Year. He holds a master's degree in aviation safety. Tom currently serves on the NAFI Board of Directors and is chairman of the Type Club Coalition Transition Training Working Group. In addition, he directs the education safety arm of a 9,000 member pilots organization and publishes the free flying lessons weekly blog at www.mastery-flight-training.com. Tom writes and lectures and instructs extensively from his home in the air capital, Wichita, Kansas. Before we get into Tom's presentation tonight, we'd like to point out a few housekeeping pieces of information. One is that WINGS credit information uh, and related information is available on the Mentor Live page. A course evaluation is going to be available to you. Also, uh, will be available, and if you complete the evaluation, you're eligible to win a NAFI 50th anniversary polo shirt. Direct viewers to Mentor Live page on the NAFI website, nafinet.org, can and get access to past uh, broadcast. In order to get there, go onto the NAFI page and click on Mentor Live. So I've given you the background on Tom, and now it's time to bring him into the picture. Welcome to tonight's Mentor Live, Tom. Thank you very much, Phil. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, devoting your time to becoming more effective flight instructors and learning uh, how to be uh, safer, and as we'll find out uh, so shortly, uh, masters and commanders of your aircraft. One of the greatest challenges we have in teaching pilots to fly is to ensure that they develop attitudes that will make them safe throughout their entire flying career. So we need to constantly ask ourselves and ask our students, are you a safe pilot? And then further, we need to ask ourselves, well, what does that really mean? We tend to define safety in terms of negatives. Uh, you see that especially just uh, very recently in the media. Uh, safety is usually expressed as a function of accidents. And it's uh, easy to think of, of safety as being merely the absence of having an accident. Uh, the root of accidents goes much deeper than mere chance and sometimes is the result of habit patterns developed over and exercised over long periods of time. So uh, just because you didn't have an accident didn't mean you're necessarily a safe pilot. Uh, teaching pilots to be safe tends to emphasize the negative and pilots want to be positive about flying their airplanes. Another issue about uh, trying to teach pilots to be safe is it shuts people off. Everybody thinks they're a safe pilot. Instead of using the concept of safety or the term safety, I think that to achieve our goal, we could emphasize two specific attitudes in flying our airplanes. The first is mastery, and the second is command. We shouldn't teach pilots to be safe because you really can't act on that. What we can do is teach them to be masters and commanders of their aircraft. And by pretty much by definition, you will then be safe. So look at what, let's look at what the two terms mean. Mastery is defined as being more than simply proficiency. Mastery in a dictionary definition is comprehensive knowledge and display of great skill in a subject or accomplishment. That's what I want to be able to do when I fly an airplane. I don't want to just barely get by uh, with the uh, the ACS or the practical test standards, I want to have comprehensive knowledge and great skill in the way I fly my airplane. I want to go far beyond that minimum. Command is something that's rarely taught 
in general aviation circles, but it's really the uh, the essence of handling an airplane, both in normal and especially emergency situations. A definition of command is to exercise direct authority or to dominate as if from an elevated place. Now, if you send a student up to a check ride and after the check ride, the examiner comes to pulls you aside and says, your student dominated the airplane. They have direct authority of the aircraft. Then you've done your job to make sure that they know how to command the situation. A little bit more about mastery and command. Uh, mastery and command really is a function of several different things. It's retaining and constantly even improving on your flying skills. Something I see out in the transition training world and primarily doing flight reviews and IPCs are pilots who uh, have let skills atrophy. Uh, they passed a check ride at one point in their life, but now they can't, they couldn't pass that check ride today. And what we want to be, what we need to be as safe pilots is to be able to pass that check ride every day and further to get even better than we were on that one day when we demonstrated the skill to examiner. Another aspect of mastering command is that proficiency is just the first step. We are continually striving to master all of the tasks and command that aircraft. It's a proactive way to pursue uh, uh, flight proficiency. In other words, instead of saying, well, I'm just going to barely get by, I'm going to continually work to get better and better. It proactively enhances your flying experience. And then lastly, if you master and command your aircraft, you will be as safe as you are able to be in the aircraft. Flying an airplane does have risks, but if you face those risks and manage those, manage those risks as master and commander of your aircraft, you will be as safe as you possibly can be in any situation that you allow yourself to fly. So let's look at this just a little bit more deeply. Again, safety is not a strategy. We can't, I can't tell you to say fly safe and have you actually do anything. It's an outcome. Safety is not a strategy, it's the outcome of mastery and command of your aircraft. Now, every one of us has a, a pilot certificate, or maybe you're working on a pilot certificate. If you think of yourself as a pilot, this is usually what you think of yourself as having. You have a certificate, you have some sort of documentation that says you have met some standards and fly the airplane. So this is how we see ourselves as pilots. But how do your passengers see you? This is how your passengers see you in command of that aircraft. They don't care if you're flying, you know, if you've got 100 total time and you're flying a Cessna 152, as far as they are concerned, you are exercising the judgment, skill, and professionalism that a professional airline captain is flying. So it's our job to prove them right. Now, the, uh, the universal worldwide symbol of the captain or commander of an aircraft are the four stripes in your epaulets. You can see them on the shoulder board here if you advance the slide. And the, the four, shoulder, four uh, stripes on your epaulets have, at least I feel, have some meaning. There are really symbols of the four different things you need to pursue to be captain of your aircraft. All right, so when you first earned your pilot certificate, you're, you're granted basically entry-level privileges. If you were to look at a shoulder board or an epaulette, you might consider it to be blank when you first pass the check right. You've reached the first step. You've got your foot in the door, but you're not really truly yet fully master of that aircraft. Uh, think of the four stripes as, having, as being four different goals that you want to constantly pursue to become an even better airplane. The first stripe would be mastering the airplane and its technology. Let's look at the first stripe. Would be mastering the airplane and its technology. Uh, learning to, or excuse me, passing a practical test is a generic examination. Uh, but there are specific techniques and procedures to every type of airplane. That's a lot of what I do is I teach the specific techniques and procedures for the type of airplane that I teach in. Every airplane has its own specific techniques and procedures, and getting even better at those is the part of the first strike, mastering the airplane. 
30 years ago when I first started teaching uh, in, in airplanes, we didn't talk very much about teaching the technology, but today the technology in our airplane is at least as challenging to master as is the aircraft itself. And so when we think about becoming captain of this airplane, one of the elements, one of the stripes is mastering the airplane and its technology. If you don't feel that you fully understand one or the other, or that you can get the airplane to consistently do what you wanted to do when you wanted to do it, then you know you need to work more on this first stripe of becoming captain of your aircraft. The second stripe is mastery of the environment and the weather. Uh, VFR or IFR, we operate in an atmosphere that contains many, many potential threats. And environment also incorporates things such as airspace, uh, operations around other aircraft, those sorts of things. And in order to fully command our airplane, we really need to know a lot more about the weather than the minimums that are required to pass our knowledge exams and our, and our uh, practical tests. So the second stripe, if, if you don't feel like you understand the weather as, best, as well as you think you should, that's what you need to work on next, become master of your aircraft. The third stripe, <clears throat> the third stripe is mastering human factors and situational awareness. Here's where we're getting into more advanced uh, skills. Uh, here's where uh, we need to think in terms of fatigue management for ourselves. We need to think in terms of uh, how I react to uh, over-the-counter medications that may or may not be allowed, how, you know, when I ground myself. Uh, also, situational awareness is, is uh easy to visualize with modern technology in the cockpit with traffic displays and moving mass and such, but we also need to uh, work on being able to uh, maintain situational awareness uh, even when those situations or when those equipment fail. So the third thing that you need to pursue is pursuing uh, human factors of awareness and situational awareness. The fourth stripe is the most elusive of them all. And as I've said before, it's it's rarely taught in civilian aviation, but that's the concept of responsibility and command of the aircraft. Uh, a very good example of that uh, very recently is the Southwest Airlines 737 uh, uncontained engine failure that uh, landed in Philadelphia. If you listen to the ATC audio of that event, you'll hear the captain and at times the first officer on the radio, and they were fully in command of that aircraft. They were telling the controllers what they needed to get the airplane safely on the ground. This is the sort of performance that you need to be able to develop in normal and abnormal and emergency situations. And if you are constantly pursuing these four stripes, these four elements of being captain, then you are in fact pursuing mastery and command of your aircraft and might well be, if you'll flip the slide here, captain of the aircraft. So let's look at some teaching tips that uh, that I use and, and you might consider using yourself to promote these concepts of mastering commanding your students. The first one is to teach pilots to know their limitations. More specifically, there are three different types of limitations. There's the uh, the aircraft, the pilot, and the environment. So the first one is let's talk about the airplane just for a moment. The aircraft that you're flying may be, if you flip the slide, the aircraft may be equipped like an airliner, but the reality is it's not. It's not certificated to the same level as an airliner. It doesn't have the same level of redundancy as airliners. Most glass cockpit general aviation airplanes do not have a backup AHARS, for, for instance. Uh, so it does have some limitations. And frankly, what we're flying in the general aviation world are recreational and business tools. So we do need to teach our students to realize that they have not purchased something that's going to be able to go in all weather. They're not going to fly, not flying something that has the same dispatch reliability as an airliner. However, again, if you flip the slide, our airplanes can be very, very safe and very capable if they are flown within their limitations. What are those limitations? Well, the limitations that are in the pilot's operating handbook and the type certificate data sheet for the aircraft and its engine and its other components, the regulations and uh, the, uh, the maneuvers that we learned uh, very early, early in our flight training applied to our everyday flying. So the first thing is teach your students what the airplane is and what it isn't. 
Next, teach them to continually learn about the weather. Weather is by far the most common reason for airline delays. So there's no reason to believe that you're going to have better dispatch reliability than the airline world. As a matter of fact, light airplanes are not as capable as handling weather as most turbine aircraft and transport aircraft. So we need to think in terms of not if, but when we're going to have to delay, reroute, or cancel flights. And if you flip through the end of the slide, please. Okay. So build time into your schedule. Tell your students or teach your students to build time into your schedule to be flexible with flying with the airplane. Flip the slide. If you teach your students to be aware of and continually learning about the weather, they can fly their airplanes flown within limits. Our airplanes can be very safe and very capable. Lastly, we as individuals need to stay within our own limitations. The federal air regulations and the pilot's operating handbooks are a minimum standard of what's, uh, what we can do in the aircraft. We, we need to be even better than that, but we can't fudge those at all. Uh, professional flight operations, charter operation airlines, they all have what are called operation specifications. And an op spec is a set of written guidelines for what they can and cannot do in those airplanes. We have an aspect in general, op spec in general aviation. It's the federal air regulations and the limitations on the aircraft and our own uh, pilot certificates. So uh, stay within your limitations and teach your students to remember what they are and what they are not. So if you flip again, uh, we need to, yeah, there we go. I got ahead of myself there. Uh, you're probably not an airline pilot or a military pilot. And if you are, you're not flying an airline or military type aircraft. Uh, the skills that are necessary to fly in a uh, single pilot general aviation airplane may apply to flying a jet, but not all of the jet skills apply to flying in a crew apply to flying a general aviation airplane. I taught the uh, factory approved flight training for Beechcraft Barons using a simulator in, in airplanes at Beach Field many years ago. In four years of teaching that program, the only student I had who was unable to complete even a VFR only completion for the Baron, Beach Baron, was at the time a current US Air Force KC-135 crew commander. Uh, but what he could do with a crew and four large turbojets in a tanker jet didn't work out in a Baron. He needed extra work on that. So he had limitations based on the type of airplane he was specific, specifically in. All right, go ahead and flip, please. All right. Lastly, even if you are a military pilot or an airline pilot, you're probably not getting the same level and, re and frequency of initial and recurrent training in a general aviation airplane. So if we flip it, if you and yes, you're not as young as you used to be. Sorry about that. But uh, flip the slide. If you stay within your limitations, the uh, FARs and the limitations in the handbook are a minimum standard. Remember that no in the rules means no. Where pilots get themselves into trouble sometimes is when they start to go beyond what is allowable. And I've spoken with many pilots who have survived abnormal events or emergencies who have uh, have told me they they knew that they were doing something against the rules. If you think you're gonna be against the rules, that's when it's time to get the airplane on the ground. So teach your students that they have to fulfill all, all of the roles in the aircraft. They are the pilot in command. We'll back up one, please. Back up, please. They're the pilot in command, but they're also the dispatcher, the director of maintenance. They're the aviation medical examiner for themselves, crew scheduler, even the chief financial officer and risk manager. Flying an airplane is a lot more than simply being the person manipulating the controls. All right, flip, please. All right, so our airplanes can be very safe and capable if the pilot flies within the limits. Your students, you need to impress upon your students that flying is a profession, even if you're not being paid to fly. It requires time, study, and expertise. It's like taking a second demanding job. One that you enjoy that has great benefits, but requires time, study, and practice. Okay, next please. Now there's a cycle of training. Uh, and this is, uh, if you've been flying a long time, you probably know that uh, areas of emphasis come and go in general aviation training. Uh, of course, uh, before the advent of uh, 
uh, highly complex general aviation airplanes. Uh, most or all of general aviation training was based on stick and rudder skills, flying the airplane. Uh, after a while, uh, when uh, stick and rudder skills weren't preventing the accidents that we hoped that they would, uh, the FAA and industry uh, moved into an aeronautical decision-making model for pilot training. We taught a lot, and we do teach a lot about risk management and making decisions, realizing that it isn't really the inability to fly the airplane that causes many accidents. It's the decisions that pilots make them put them into positions. They have to exercise great skill the, uh, in the aircraft. But after a while, we found also aeronautical decision making wasn't, proved, wasn't solving everything. At the same time, we had the rise of flight automation, autopil advanced autopilots, advanced avionics in our airplanes. And for a while, we got into the flight in industry training standards and a, and a high level of uh, emphasis on learning the avionics of our aircraft and using autopilots, uh, even in some cases, to compensate for lack of basic flying skills. And so we've gone through this cycle. Guess what? Flight automation doesn't fix everything either. And we end up coming back to where we are currently, an emphasis on stick and rudder skills. Even in the airline world, the FAA is emphasizing pilots hand fly the airplane a lot. The reality is, it's a holistic training environment. No one of these items is going to improve the general aviation accident rate. No one of them is going to make you master or commander of your aircraft. We need to emphasize all of these areas uh, to the extent that the airplane being flown is automated. We have to uh, uh, make sure pilots can fly with it and without it. And as you train your pilots, and especially if you're doing flight reviews with pilots that are seeing you for just a short while, we want to make sure that we cover all three of these areas so that we ensure that they know all about the entire cycle of training. All right, next slide, please. Pretty much already covered this. Uh, modern airmanship requires that we master all three of these skills. Another teaching tip is to make every flight a training flight. Now, there's a lot of emphasis on flight training, obviously, to reduce the accident rate and make our pilots safer. Uh, there is a perception, I've heard it myself at times, a perception that, well, you're just trying to drum up business for flight instructors. Well, maybe true, but the reality is that uh, you can realize, an individual pilot can realize great training benefit from a flight, even if they are flying solo, if they're not flying with an instructor at the time. One of the issues that we are concerned with is that flying from point A to point B, uh, what a lot of pilots do with their airplanes between flight reviews, between check rides, uh, it exposes you to what happens then, but it leaves out what might have happened, but did not. Knowing our airplanes is a function of two different things, experience and training. Experience comes from what happens to you. You saw it flying to point A, from point A to point B, so you get good at it. Training is learning from the experiences of others. Sometimes training happens when you have a flight instructor on board with you or you're doing ground school. Other times it happens from listening to programs like this, reading books, reading magazine articles, watching videos online. Training, however, is the function of benefiting from the experience of pilots that have done things that you have not yourself. So, Teach your pilots to make every flight a training flight. It does not have to be dual instruction, but every flight should be done with a purpose and pilots should uh, measure their performance against uh, regulatory and personal standards to ensure that they're getting better every time. One example of that is something that I call the second strike challenge. And it's a way to uh, retain and sharpen your skills that's kind of fun, actually, and it will definitely make you a, a better pilot. Now, a standard runway marking, uh, if, a, if a runway has standard markings, then each runway stripe is about 120 feet long, and each space between the stripes is 80 feet. So the combination of a stripe and a space is about 200 feet, at least toward the ends of the runway. If the runway is not exactly the, the right length that this works out perfectly, then they adjust it in the middle of the runway. But towards the ends of a standard runway, a stripe and a space will be 200 feet. Well, let's use that knowledge to uh, compare our landing performance to what it was on the day that we passed our first check ride. 
Remember that if you're if you're taking a private recreational or sport pilot uh, exam, the standard for a normal landing is that you touch down minus zero plus 400 feet from an identified spot. 400 feet sounds like a lot of distance until you're looking at the runway on short final and realize that means you have to touch down on that stripe or that stripe. You have two stripes or you're out. <laughs> so uh, focus on trying to land on what I call the second stripe challenge, which is I'm always going to try to touch down on the second stripe and I'm going to touch down no sooner than that and no later than the third stripe. If you want to move it down to the touchdown zone box, that's fine. But I like to do this because not all airport, uh, not all runways are marked for instrument landings like this. So we want to be able to consistently touch down within that 200 feet. Go ahead and turn uh, the slide. If you're a commercial pilot or working on your commercial certificate, you'll notice that the uh, uh, the criteria for success on your check ride is minus zero plus 200 feet. When the examiner says, all right, you're uh, working on your commercial uh, uh, certificate check ride right now, and I want you to do to a, uh, a normal landing, you've got one stripe in one space, or you've bust the check ride. So that's a pretty tight tolerance. My goal is to try to hit at least that good every time. If I'm coming down final approach and I'm not going to touch down in that touchdown zone, uh, if I'm not going to touch down on the second or or third stripe, I'm going to go around until I get it right. And then I'm going to figure out why I couldn't do it right today. If I find I can't consistently touch down on the second or third stripe, even um, after trying several times, I'll go get some dual with a flight instructor and see how I can fix that. Remember, you were able to demonstrate flight to this level of precision at least once in your life when you earned your pilot certificate. There's no reason that you shouldn't be getting even better during your day-to-day -day flying. Let's flip the slide. Okay, let's go ahead and flip it again. All right, third tip. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of automation. I like to use autopilots when it's appropriate to use autopilots, but I'm also a big hand of retaining the ability to fly the airplane if something should happen and it's not working. And so one of the things that I teach my students and I recommend you teach your students as well, is to hand fly the airplane a lot. Fatal crashes often result from the pilot's inability to hand fly the airplane in the very early moments after an autopilot or a trim failure. Pilots that if they do lose control of the airplane often do so almost immediately upon a trim runway or autopilot disconnect. So what we need to do is to uh, prevent ourselves from letting an autopilot take us anywhere that you can't immediately take over and hand fly the airplane. One of the best ways I've found to retain this level of precision is to hand fly level offs. Now most uh, uh, high performance airplanes now, many high performance airplanes do have altitude pre-selects on their autopilots. And I do like to use them especially during descents. But if I'm not in an especially high workload environment when I level off, I will almost always disengage the autopilot and hand fly the level off. And here's why. As you level off, several things are changing. First, the pitch attitude you see down on the bottom here. You'll go from a climb attitude to a level flight attitude. And depending on the type of your uh, uh, airplane you're flying and the way the load is distributed, you might even end up, as you accelerate, you might even end up in a slightly nose down uh, trim attitude for level flight once you've gotten up to cruise speed. So there is going to be a fairly large change in pitch attitude from climb speed to cruise speed that you'll have to make gradually. As you're making this and the airplane's accelerating, what's happening? The airplane's trim is changing. In some models of airplane, it changes quite dramatically. As you accelerate just bit by bit, the speed will increase and increase and increase. The more it increases, the more you'll have to trim down, trim down, trim down. And you'll find that there may be a significant change between the climb setting and the cruise setting, but one of the tricks is it doesn't happen instantaneously. It's a gradual process. If you retain, if you practice your level offs, hand flying your level offs, you can retain a very fine tuned skill for flying the aircraft. And if you can accurately level off the airplane, you are rapidly seeing the effect of uh, performance changes on the aircraft and commanding it to do exactly what you want to do. 
Okay, another tip is to teach mode awareness in the airplane. Mode awareness, and uh, the, the old saw is that there are no new ways to crash an airplane, but the reality is that there is one about 15 years old now, which is not knowing what mode the aircraft or its autopilot is in. So one of the things we need to constantly ask ourselves and ask your students, what is the autopilot doing now? Uh, we need to develop a level of fluency in automation that matches our, our fluency in the aircraft itself. In other words, we need to put as much time into learning and mastering the avionics as we do into learning and mastering the airplane. We need to know ahead of time, if you'll flip, know what the avionics are doing and more importantly, what they will do next. I, that's actually my personal definition of being mode aware, knowing what the avionics are doing now and what it's going to do next. Predictability is very important. Then we need to actively cross check and monitor what the autopilot and the avionics are doing. Uh, a common uh, uh, mistake I see is engaging an autopilot and failing to double check that the modes selected are those that you want before you release uh, command or release control. You never release command, but release control to the autopilot. And then you have to continue to constantly monitor it. As I said, this is the new way to crash an air, airplane. Uh, another way, one of my uh, students actually uh, explained to me one time, he said uh, an autopilot is a very, very good but very stupid co-pilot. It will do exactly what you tell it to do, no matter if whether that's what you want it or not. Okay, somebody came up with a question. Um, how should we handle a situation when a student that needs an IPC says he never hand flies an approach? Well, you know, here's a question. Uh, if you are flying an approach on an autopilot in virtually all general aviation airplanes, at the moment you reach the decision height, decision altitude, missed approach point, whatever defines the missed approach point, if you do not see the runway environment and you need to uh, miss the approach, the first thing you need to do is to disengage the autopilot. Most autopilots do not have the capability of making the transition into the missed approach which means you need to have a very, very fine-tuned uh, ability to fly the airplane precisely because you are turning off the autopilot and transitioning from a fairly rapid descent into a fairly rapid climb, all from a point that may be as low as 200 feet above the ground. And if you're not ready to hand fly the airplane through that transition, then you are not safe, if you will, in flying an instrument approach using the autopilot. Uh, I tell the students, what I'd like to do is I'll show some uh, students uh, power settings and configurations that make the airplane fly the, uh, for instance, an ILS approach or a GPS glide slope, uh, glide path approach uh, consistently in as low a workload as possible. And so let's, let's just give it a try and see how that works out. Uh, if pilots have specific power setting and configuration targets for flying the airplane, they'll find it's fairly easy to fly the aircraft. But the the ultimate point that I make is um, uh, the autopilot can fail at any time. I've had autopilots fail on me. You need to be able to retain that skill to hand fly an approach. And you need to be able to demonstrate, actually when I do an IPC, I, I make a pilot demonstrate that they can hand fly that they can fly coupled, and if the airplane has a flight director, that they can fly by reference to the flight director as well. Tom, okay, uh, the, question, or the question would be about the instrument check ride. All right, I uh, don't quite understand exactly. Phil, do you get what he's saying? Yeah, I think he's asking what would be your advice on the instrument check ride. Would you continue to hand fly it or would you use the automation available to you? Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm not an examiner. If I were an examiner, I would I would require that the pilot demonstrate the ability to do, to do both. And the ACS actually does uh, talk to that. Uh, I, I, uh, I think that uh, uh, flying the, the, the autopilot is as essential a, a piece of an IFR capable airplane as uh, many other devices, many other instruments. And so I would want to see a pilot be able to demonstrate it uh, used both ways. If that's and another point that occurred to me when you're talking about both the first question and this one is, is 
you may be very stable when you're flying the autopilot down, but due to differences in loading and ground speed, wind speed uh, combinations, you may get dramatically different pitch response from it because of the amount of nose down or nose up loading that the autopilot's having to put in. Um, and that can be a real surprise to you when you're not doing it. That's exactly right. Yeah, an autopilot does have the capability to apply some, if you'll, if you'll call it that manual pressure to the trim system without actually retrimming. And so that's why it's not uncommon at all when you disengage an autopilot for it to pitch up or pitch down a little bit. It can be and will be usually slightly out of trim. Uh, so wrapping it all up about those two questions, uh, I do require my IPC students to demonstrate the ability to hand fly as well as fly coupled approaches if they have uh, autopilot equipment that's capable of flying coupling. Uh, I suspect that any examiner, any IFR examiner now uh, is going to require, if an airplane has uh, the capability of flying a, flying a couple of approaches, probably going to require both as part of the check ride. Um, Jason Blair, who was who is a designated pilot examiner and uh, past executive director of NAFI, uh, recently wrote on Facebook that at least 50% of the instrument practical test failures that he sees result from an inability to understand and operate the avionics. Uh, it's very challenging from an instructor standpoint to uh, teach avionics because they can be different in every, every type of airplane. But we do need to make the effort to learn the avionics for each aircraft we fly and to, more importantly, to make sure that our students understand how to use them. Okay. Another important teaching tip is to make and follow a fuel plan. According to uh, AOPA, about once a week in the United States, somebody runs out of gas. More frequently than that, pilots uh, have a fuel starvation event, which is where you drain one tank dry, or for some other reason, you have fuel on board this airplane somewhere, but it's not getting to the engine. So we have a, a real responsibility to teach our students to make and follow fuel plans. One of the big, one of the main elements, of course, is to ensure that you have the fuel you think you do on board the aircraft at all. Uh, many, many different ways, there are many, many different ways to check fuel levels in an airplane. Some apply to some airplanes, others apply to others, some apply to all. Uh, use as many different ways as possible to check the fuel level before you fly the aircraft. For example, uh, for a while I was managing a flight, a small flight department for a company in Tennessee. We had two Beechcraft Barons. I flew one Baron most of the time. My boss flew the other Baron most of the time, but we could swap back and forth and sometimes we did. So we wanted to make certain that we always knew how much fuel we had on board the aircraft. Uh, further, we were working for, uh, well, we were doing a lot of equipment hauling and things. So there were times when we would not routinely be able to fill the tanks completely up because of the loading of the aircraft. So it was vital that we be able to determine how much fuel was on board. In those airplanes, we could visually check the fuel level only if they were more than about three quarters full because of the geometry of the tanks. You couldn't see any fuel below that. Uh, they had external sight gauges on top of the wings. Uh, we would keep an accurate record in the cockpit. We would write down tack times and the amount of fuel added to each tank in this book that stayed in the airplane. We could check that. Uh, the cockpit fuel gauges themselves, of course. Uh, we had fuel totalizers, which are very accurate, assuming that you actually put the correct information into them. And then lastly, fuel receipts from the FBO. Our rule to ourselves was that we would check every possible way, all of these ways, before we would fly the airplane. And if any one of them revealed a discrepancy of some sort, we would resolve that discrepancy and add additional fuel as needed before we would fly the aircraft. So figure out how many different ways you can check the fuel level in your aircraft and check it in as many ways as possible to ensure that you won't be one of those persons that succumbs to uh, erroneous readings or a fuel leak you weren't aware of or something like that and end up running out of gas. Another thing related to fuel, another item is to, of course, make methodical calculations. This is actually quite easy now with most electronic flight bag. Uh, if assuming that the information is loaded properly, you can get some very accurate uh, predictions of what the uh, fuel is going likely going to be. And then you can make conservative estimates of uh, how much fuel you need to make a trip. I personally use one hour 
uh, as a minimum as my of my uh, for my reserve. And if I'm in flight and my totalizer shows I'm going to have less than one hour of fuel on board at that point uh, when I land, I'm either going to adjust the power in the mixture to get my hour reserve back or I'm going to land early. So make methodical calculations. Make conservative estimates. I ask pilots a lot of time, well, how much, how much does your fuel burn? And I'll hear things like, well, 15 gallons per hour. Well, that's true in cruise flight, but what about climb, takeoff and climb? And very frequently, if you have a high performance airplane uh, specifically, specifically uh, you'll see that the first hour burns significantly more than subsequent hours. In the Beechcraft Bonanzas, I routine, routinely fly. I estimate 20 gallons per hour per the uh, 20 gallons for the first hour, and then 15 gallons every hour after that. And that's very conservative, also. And then, lastly, think in terms of time aloft, not distance. Don't think I've got enough fuel to get all the way from here to there. Think instead, I've got four hours and 32 minutes of fuel on board, or whatever the case may be for you, and make your decisions based on the time aloft, not the distance you're trying to fly. Once you're in flight, how many ways can you monitor the fuel? Compare your actual to expected indications and not just uh, the total fuel required to get to your destination. I like to mark on a chart or make a note on a, you know, if I'm not, if I'm using an iPad for my en route charts, I'll make a note on my, my, uh, lap, uh, my knee board of approximately where I will be when I am at half tanks. And if I'm at half tanks before that point, something's wrong. I need to look into it. All right, somebody asked, how about dipping the tanks? That's absolutely true. You can use a dipstick in fuel tanks in airplanes that have very little dihedral to the wings. For instance, uh, most of the Cessnas, not all of the high wings, like early Cessna 210s have a lot of dihedral to them. But most Cessnas, yes, you can use a dipstick in the fuel tanks. Planes I fly, Cessna, the, um, the, the Beechcraft, Bonanzas, and Barons, there's so much dihedral to the wing uh, there's, there's very little fuel bladder visible below the filler port. And so it's below about three quarters of tank. You literally cannot see any fuel in the tank at all. So it's pointless, almost pointless to dipstick a, a tank like that. So that's a very type specific sort of situation. Can I back up just a little bit about what? Oh, <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> all right. All right. Fuel totalizer. I'm kind of leaning into the question there. Sorry about that. Uh, if you have a fuel totalizer, fuel totalizers are a very accurate device for determining the amount of fuel on board. Uh, some of the limitations of totalizers, uh, they're only as good as the information you input into them at the beginning of flight. Fuel totalizers will tell you how much fuel you have on board, but not where that fuel is. So if you have an airplane with multiple, multiple fuel tanks, you can't determine precisely where the fuel is on board the aircraft. And then lastly, if you have any sort of fuel leak, a fuel cap leak or something like that, you can't see that that will not be registered on the fuel totalizer because it's only measuring the amount of fuel that's actually being burned by the engine. Cockpit fuel gauges have a reputation for inaccuracy. The reality is the regulations do require that they be accurate, uh, not just at empty as is sometimes said, but they actually are required by regulation to be accurate at uh, intermediate settings as well in flight. The, the nice thing about fuel gauges is that uh, uh, they are a good quality control check on the other devices. If your totalizer says you're good and if your time on your watch and your known fuel says you're good, then uh, you'll find uh, if you see that your fuel gauges are reading abnormally low, you might have an indication of a leak. So fuel gauges are a good cross check against the other items. All right, suppose the fuel gauges are not accurate. Um, you, they're assuming that it's, uh, it's, the airplane is, is airworthy. Prime, your primary way of determining your fuel on board is always going to be a known amount of fuel on board at the beginning of the flight, a known amount of fuel burn, and then uh, accurate tracking of the time, okay? All right, check your ETA and, and your fuel remaining at critical waypoints along the way. Also, uh, scan behind the filler caps and along the wing trailing edge for any sign of any leak. I was taking off in a Beach Baron once and had a slight, uh, one of my fuel caps had a slight leak to it. Uh, I noticed looking at the trailing edge of the wing, I could see a little mist coming off of that. And that told me I was, I was siphoning over fuel overboard. So I needed to land to get it checked out. So there are lots of, way to monitor, lots of ways to monitor your fuel in flight. Uh, you, you need to be consistent or constantly monitoring your fuel 
in order to master the uh, fuel monitoring task that you have as a pilot. Another area is to get real about fatigue in airplanes. Fatigue is one of the great unknowns in general aviation crashes. Uh, we don't know very much about it because it's not investigated very thoroughly. The NTSB does a very good job of investigating what happened at the moment or just prior to the moment of impact. But uh, often there may be un, um, underlying fatigue issues that the NTSB simply does not have the resources to try to investigate. So it's our job to make sure that we are fully rested and actually fit to fly the aircraft. Now, you may be a morning person or a night person. I'm a morning person. I can get up at four in the morning and be ready to jump out of bed and go do something. That means if I'm going to take a trip, if I'm, I'm going to make a long flight, I probably want to start in the morning. I'm not so much a night person, so uh, finishing up work at five in the evening and then going out to the airplane and, and, and going off to fly the aircraft on a long trip somewhere is probably not a good plan for me. You may be exactly the opposite, but whatever the case may, uh, may be, uh, plan your trips around your own personal uh, sleep cycles. Uh, you may also get a little drowsy around siesta time in the afternoon. I do that at work at my computer. I have to stand up. I have a stand-up desk, and I have to stand up at about uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, or I'll get a little bit drowsy. Uh, so again, plan your flights around the times when you tend to uh, have fatigue issues. A lot of accidents seem to happen uh, Friday evening Somebody get, has been working hard all week, then they jump in the airplane to go off on a trip. They fly into the night. They may be a little bit too tired to handle everything that comes at them. So again, I try to avoid that sort of thing personally. Unless you have a solid track record of being very alert and very awake and very active uh, after the end of the day, I, I wouldn't spend much time in an airplane on a long trip after a Friday work. Another situation is coming home Sunday afternoon after a long week out in the sun and you're kind of worn out from the family trip uh, and, and now you want to fly back home uh, Sunday evening. Uh, there we get into some serious, as we call it, get home itis uh, potential. You want to get home, you need to get back home. On top of all of that, your judgment may be impaired, your judgment and performance may be impaired by fatigue. So uh, you might have to excuse yourself to the family and say, well, we have to leave Sunday morning so we have plenty of time to get back home before uh, it gets too late. But again, plan your trips around your own personal schedules. Here's the real trick. You don't have to be able to evaluate only how you feel at the beginning of a trip. You have to use your experience and your own awareness of your fatigue say, to determine how you're likely to feel if you have to fly an approach at the end of a long and bumpy trip. Uh, it might be getting dark. So uh, not only do we have to judge our fatigue state now, we have to try to predict that fatigue state in the future. The uh, National Business Aviation Association does have some recommendations about fatigue. Uh, one of them is that they recommend a maximum 10 hour maximum flying duty day. Now that's a lot of time. Now maybe if you're an instructor pilot, well obviously if instructors have a, an eight hour maximum, we're required to stay within. But uh, uh, maybe if you're flying professionally, you might fly 10 hours in a day. Most of us don't fly that much. Uh, the one that we might be able to act on better is the NBAA's recommendation for a 14-hour duty day. And although they don't define it as such, I, I think of the duty day as being alarm clock to engine shutdown. If I wake up at 5 in the morning and go to work, that's when my 14-hour recommended time starts. And so I need to be back on the ground at the end of my flight by 7 p.m. that evening unless I've been able to take a nap. So think about the, the, the cumulative effects of fatigue and use as a personal limitation something like a 14 or even a 12 hour maximum duty day just to ensure that you get on the ground before you start to become excessively affected by fatigue. Now remember these NBAA recommendations are also assuming a crew environment where you have somebody else to watch out for you. And we don't have that capability most of the time in our airplanes. Sort of a, a corollary to what we've been talking about here, which is uh, dealing with passengers and family members that sometimes apply some pressure perhaps on us to complete a flight on time. Something you can do is teach your students and do yourself is to involve the family and passengers 
in the go no go decision making process now i'm not saying that you should uh, delegate the actual decision to your family members and, and have them be the ones that decide whether you go or not uh, however if if they say no go they should have the authority to stop you but have the authority to make you go in the first place what i am saying though is that i think a lot of the stress that we pilots put ourselves under because of family pressures are the result of our past our, our family members not or passengers not realizing what goes into making these kind of decisions so we need to guide their expectations tell them why we decide the things we have to do and then involve them in the go no go decisions uh, i've had several flights where i'm in bright blue sunny skies like you see in the picture here uh, my passengers don't know there's a line of severe storms 50 miles away they can't see it they haven't seen what i've seen and so they're wondering why we don't go ahead and go now all you need to do is say okay here's why we're not going to go we're going to have to put the airplane in the hangar and sit this out for a while so involve them in your go no go decisions as much as possible next slide please often i think it's the family pressure that prompts us to take what we would otherwise consider to be unacceptable risks. Gee, I really wouldn't do this, but I need to be home for junior's soccer game or something like that. And I think, and I know in my own personal case with my family, if they understand the risk factors that I'm facing, they're less likely to pressure me to try to make a trip. They'll learn that I am making judgments for a reason and they'll learn to trust my judgment. All right, now in a lot of cases, we have uh, uh, we we focus on flight instruction for uh, certificates and ratings. However, there is great opportunity for us as instructor pilots uh, to do flight reviews and IPCs for aircraft owners. And in fact, if we are going to make a major reduction in um, accidents, what we really need to do is address the the greatest amount of the audience, which are owner pilots of airplanes. And one of the things that is not taught to owner pilots, uh, there is no requirement for anyone to ever teach anyone how to be an airplane owner. So I thought I would throw this in here uh, for those of you who are flying uh, in airplanes that are owned by your clients. We ought to spend a little time maybe in flight reviews and preparing them for check rights and talking about real world airworthiness of their airplanes. What most people call maintenance is really three different things, aircraft inspection, maintenance, and repair. Each one is distinct, and so we'll cover each one of them individually. First is inspection. The uh, aircraft inspection is everything from a scheduled annual or 100-hour inspection down to our pre-flight inspection every time we fly. And in all cases, the purpose of inspection is to confirm the airworthiness of the aircraft, and also to confirm conformity. In other words, we want to make sure that everything works like it's supposed to work, and that nothing is damaged, everything is as it should be for that particular airplane. We're also detecting any minor squawks that the regulations might allow us to defer for a while, but inspection is the process of confirming the airworthiness of the aircraft. The next step is maintenance. Now, when uh, a lot of aircraft owners you'll work with talk about uh, annual inspections, they'll call it a maintenance event. Well, I'm taking my plane in for inspection, and they think that maintenance is somehow tied directly to inspection. The reality is inspection that's, is something that happens at distinct uh, intervals, either per flight or annually or 100 hours. Maintenance is something that happens all of the time. And maintenance is the process of preventing damage and preserving the conformity. We're maintaining the aircraft's integrity. The last of the uh, issues is called is repair. And the process of repair is restoring airworthiness, returning an airplane that's broken uh, to conformity and back to airworthiness. Uh, repair is distinct from maintenance. You constantly maintain your airplane. Repair happens when something's broken. Putting it in, uh, in a, a different light, or looking at it a different way in the next, next slide, uh, the totality of airworthiness goes like this. First, the purpose of maintenance is to prevent the need for repair. We change the oil so we don't have to repair the engine. We air up the tires so we don't have to repair the tires. The purpose of inspection is to assure that your efforts at maintenance have been effective. 
And then the purpose of repair is to take care of things that were not maintained properly or wore out uh, during the normal course of use. Uh, one of the problems with repair is they, they usually occur at the worst possible time when you're trying to get home from somewhere or trying to go off on a trip. Next slide, please. Okay. You must continually inspect the aircraft. Next. You may defer some, defer some, but not all maintenance items. Some things you have to do in between annual inspections. You cannot defer repairs, and that's the distinction. If something is broken, you can't say, well, they'll catch that at the annual inspection. The airplane's not airworthy in most cases. So continually inspect, defer some, but not all maintenance, and get things repaired right away. All right, wrapping this all up here, there are many, many aspects we've talked about to mastery and command of the aircraft. When you tell people to be safe, when you tell them, we're going to teach you to exercise care and decision making, that bounces off a lot of people, I found, because most people think that they are safe pilots already. So to improve the accident record, and so that we all enjoy a long, healthy aviation life, I think that we should stop teaching so much about safety and teach about mastery and command of the aircraft. Next slide, please. Okay. So challenge your students, challenge yourself to constantly get better, to use the practical test and, air, and uh, airman certification standards as a minimum standard. Every time you fly, judge your own, evaluate your own performance against your ability to fly to those standards. Any questions? Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much for listening this evening. This will be posted uh, on the NAFI website as described earlier. Uh, for those of you who are NAFI members, we really appreciate your membership. If you're not a member of the National Association of Flight Instructors, I invite you to take a look at nafinet.org, see what NAFI has to offer you. And thank you all for listening tonight. Thanks a lot, Tom. It's been a very interesting presentation. I did want to uh, follow up with one suggestion or uh, idea that you had, and that was when you were talking about OPSPECs and we have the FAR. I think there's another movement out there that has also given a, an availability for essentially an OPSPEC uh, for general aviation, people outside of 121 and 135, and that's the various code of conducts mm -hmm. that are floating around. So you might want to mention that for a second. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was uh, on the Code of Conduct review team for a while, but the Aviator's Model Code of Conduct. If you Google uh, model code of, Aviator's Model Code of Conduct, you'll see there are actually a number of codes. Uh, they're recommended best practices for uh, uh, really, if you want to put it this way, exercising your command authority in an aircraft and ensuring that you are master of the aircraft. Uh, there are different codes for uh, different uh, types or different uh, styles of flying. For instance, there's a glider code of conduct. There's a, a, uh, um, a helicopter code of conduct. Of course, there's one for fixed wing. There's a flight instructor's code of conduct. Uh, there's even now one recently released on uh, piloting uh, remote or uh, unmanned aerial vehicles code of conduct. So uh, thanks, Phil. That's an important point. Uh, look up the aviator's model code of conduct and see what recommendations it has for you. Okay, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, thanks for being here tonight to work with us on this program. And also like to remind everybody of the WINGS credit, information, course evaluation. Um, the course evaluation, if you go onto the web and give an evaluation of the program, you get a chance to win a 50th anniversary shirt from NAFI. And again, you can find that at the Mentor Live page on the NAFI website. So thanks again to everybody for coming. Hope you enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And we will see you at next month's Mentor Live. Thank you.